I'm a person who is doing all this public rooting for trans people. Like, I love my trans kid, I love myself. Like, if I can't believe that a trans person could be a bishop, how could anyone? That was Bishop Megan Rohr. I'm Jeff, and this is Storied San Francisco. In this podcast, Megan continues their life story. Topics include realizing they're queer, realizing they're trans, having a black trans kid in San Francisco, after college, deciding that they would better help folks as a pastor, their move to Berkeley for seminary, working with the homeless and hungry on Polk Street, meeting their wife, starting a family and moving to the sunset, and becoming a bishop in the Lutheran Church. We end the episode with Bishop Megan's reflections on life in San Francisco these days. Here's Bishop Megan. So in South Dakota, this might surprise you to learn, I had no idea LGBTQ people existed at all. Okay. Until Newt Gingrich became the Speaker of the House. Yes, thank you, Newt Gingrich. Well, thank you, his sister. <laughs> okay, I'm not familiar. I think it's Candace Gingrich. Okay. And she was like the dykiest dyke at the time. Okay. Like, imagine short hair, military fatigue pants, mm-hmm. and then like crop tops. Yes. And like angry at her brother. And so she was like on the TV, and I was like, what? And then like Ellen did a thing where she like came out on TV, and I remember very specifically and intentionally watching it in a different room of the house. Um, And then as every story progresses, um, realized that I was queer in college my freshman year. Mm -hmm. When you like fall in love with someone you think is just your friend. Mm -hmm. Um, Identified as lesbian because I didn't, because transgender wasn't a word then. Right. Transsexual was a thing. But it was a very different understanding than kind of the expansive way of thinking about gender diversity that it is now. So identified as lesbian through college. Then when I moved to Berkeley to seminary, genderqueer was like a word that was just starting to be used by all the cool kids who were nerds. It was very nerdy. Yeah. Yeah. So then I started identifying as genderqueer. um, And then maybe in the, as the transgender umbrella started becoming a thing, in maybe the 2000s and 7s ishes, mm-hmm. maybe mm-hmm. is when that word was birthed in that way. Okay. Um, started using that language, and then, you know, because it's a, uh, being trans, I think people, because doctors in the 60s and 70s around the Bay Area, Stanford and other medical facilities kind of created a narrative for what a real trans person was like. Just one yes. model. Yeah, and, and they yeah. had all these rules that you can find in the LGBTQ archive. Mm-hmm. Like, um, it's funny stuff like the only people who ever transitioned from female to male are people with lots of tattoos. Oh, God. And so there are all these like newsletters of trans people being like, if you go to this doctor, get a tattoo first, or he won't approve you. Okay. Like, so they would share the information about the narratives that doctors decided was the only way you really were a thing. Mm-hmm. And then people would repeat those stories. And so the story about like, I'm a person, and then on the inside I feel this way, and on the outside I feel this way, that's a narrative that mm-hmm. came from these clinics from non-trans people. And so it's language we still use because we want to get healthcare. We want to be able to have rights. We want to be able to describe our story in a way that speaks to non-trans people. And for right. some people, that's their experience. But for most trans people, it's a very complicated process because still today, in a lot of states across the United States, if you want to change your ID, your name on your ID, you have to prove you're infertile. Okay. So you have to have a letter from a doctor saying you've done an irreversible thing that makes you transgender. Okay. And so what that means is, is that particularly for people who haven't decided to be infertile for the rest of their life, mm-hmm. that regardless of what they might want, like if you had 
the ability to just go to a body store and pick your perfect idea. I'm sure you are the only person on the planet who would pick the exact same body, but everyone else would be like, whatever the thing is. And because magazines that are for female-bodied people on the cover tell you how to fix the areas you don't like, you, you can assume growing up that that's an experience everyone shares. Mm -hmm. And because every after-school special between 1988 and, 19, and 2000s was about how there's a part of your body you don't like, right? Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. I don't like a part of my body, right? That that's a part of the puberty experience. Mm -hmm that it can be very difficult for people to figure out what is the normal way people wish they had different parts on their body or had different shapes or worked out more or ate better or whatever the list is for yourself. Mm -hmm. What's the normal amount that people wonder if their body could be better? And what's the amount that makes you trans? And right. that's where it's really hard to be able to like express yourself out loud. Mm -hmm. And then there's all the stuff you imagine that might go wrong with employment and with going to the bathroom and with Societal someone loving you. And, right, because yeah. what if what you choose at the body store is not what the person who loves you would choose at the body store? Right. Do you love the person you love by selecting what they want you to? I mean, everyone's had at least a day in their life. They've chosen an outfit that makes someone they care about think they look Right. right. Minimally. And there are other choices people make with their body because that's the way they want to be loving to people they love. Right? Whether it's our mom that we're loving by making those choices mm -hmm. or, you know, a, a significant other or what, the, what we think our kids' teachers need to see or a faith community. All those choices are incredibly complicated for folk who don't have a trans sparkle. Right. Then add all the weird rules and laws about it, and the fact that your insurance company might get a say, and you and your doctor might get a right. say, and um, the laws change all the time. The forty-fifth president might get a say. Yeah, or your children might be removed from your home, right. or all of those things. So, in addition to this, um, one thing I'm kind of gathering is that that it's been a journey. Um, it's been an evolution, not only as far as you figuring it out, but yeah. having the words and having yeah. understanding and, and things like that. And and it spanned your time in South Dakota and then coming out here. Yeah. Well, intended. and it's and it's been a really interesting journey because now, as someone who is publicly recognized as a trans person or has lots of significant headlines that are like, big, it's out there. Most known trans person, most religious trans person, whatever the headline is of any given time. Yeah. Like, you know, you do like a three minute appearance on Good Morning America, you're not really getting into the nuance of like, <laughs> You're the timeline of your feeling about your name or the timeline of your feeling about your body or the timeline of your feeling about hormones or the timeline of your feeling about what you want your kids to call you. Right. Right? So, and I have a kid who's trans. Okay. And so I will add that I thought I had a lot of stuff figured out for myself and having a kid who's trans is like a whole nother planet. Your kid like, teaches you things? Or? That... And, like, there were a lot of things where I was like, oh, yeah, like, this is the choice I want to make. And now I'm like, well, I don't want to put, like, a kid at risk. Or, like, I know how to advocate for myself. Oh, and I kind of, like, lived in a time period where you just, like, like, I learned how to just not hear when people use pronouns because there was no expectation they'd ever get my pronoun, right? Like, it just wasn't going to happen. And so, but now, my kid will, like, be in tears for three days if someone doesn't get their pronoun right. And so, I care in a different, I care with, like, a parental heart, right? On behalf of, or for them. Yeah, yeah. or, like, you know, whereas I would 
probably just like use a bathroom or more like most trans people not use bathrooms and then just suffer the medical consequences of not using bathrooms when one ought to. Um, like, I, I, I am the person who's like, I'm gonna tell the manager, like, my kid needs, San Francisco law says, all public buildings have to have a gender neutral bathroom. Where is the gender neutral bathroom in these elementary right. schools? Because it's the law and what's going on, right? right? So I feel like I, there's the way I would advocate for myself, which is probably like to be treated worse. Hmm. And then the way that I advocate for my kid, which is like, no, we live in San Francisco and you deserve these things. Do you cite the statute? I do. I there was a period of time where I printed it out and I put it in my kid's backpack because yes. they were going swimming with their after school program and had to change like with other kids and with no adults around. And so we like read through the law and I put it in their backpack and we practiced like pulling it out and being like you are breaking the law if you try to tell me I can't use this bathroom and right on. and it's just a weird thing to have to do. And even now, like... It is, but it's like... Who else is going to do my it? My people right? have fought for these laws. I know. No, and I it's know. like, it's law now. It's a big deal that it's... Anyway. Yeah. And I think it's been interesting after I got elected bishop and all those headlines were happening because there's a danger to it, a very real danger. Right. But... Um, my little, my little black trans kid, who is one of the most vulnerable of the types of trans people to be, um, I was like, I'm so sorry, like, I'm very busy and I have to travel a lot now. And they just said, but it's important. Hmm. Like, we need you to do this. And, and they meant, like, trans people need you to do this. And I was just like, oh, okay, we'll do it. It's going to be fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they got it. Right? They're the best. Um... Okay, I don't want to leave that this topic. I, I feel like it's just to, it's who you are. But um, let's hear your move to the Bay Area story. Yeah. So I worked I worked at the shelter for abused and neglected kids, age three to twelve, and because I just thought like I can just do social work stuff. I don't have to do pastor stuff. And there was this kid who had who was six ish, and he had tried to kill himself twelve times wouldn't tell anyone why and one day he like crawls on my lap and he goes do you want to know why I'm doing this and I said yes and he said I heard at church that if you're bad you go to hell and I want to die before I'm so bad that I go to hell and I just thought I am going to keep having encounters where people need a pastor and I can either get trained for it or I can wing it and hope it goes well and so I um, had had been approved for the seminary and I was like I'm coming right now how did you find it? well I had made this deal with God that I didn't have to be a pastor if there was no seminary where they would be safe to be queer Right. and in the 2000s, there were very few places because people were still doing kind of like blaming every hurricane on gay people. Oh, I remember that. Uh, yeah. Pat, uh, Pat, Pat Robertson? It was Contra- a lot of people. Well, right. But we stopped controlling the wind, so they're not so mad anymore. That was really thoughtful of you all. Thank you. Yeah. So who's, <laughs> who's, who's calling all those hurricanes and floods and fires now? Global warming. Oh. What, it's science? What Nonsense. Are you yeah. <laughs> no, I think, um, yeah, so I, I just didn't want to go if it was not going to be safe or if I, it was going to be all about, like, why would anyone want to go get a grad degree if you, could, if you weren't allowed to be a pastor anyway? Right. And I learned about this group of pastors who use this ancient, nerdy, Lutheran law called the Small Called Articles. I what is it called again? Them. Small called articles. It's in the Lutheran Book of Confession, which is 726 pages long, and says confession is not necessary. Okay. It's a long book to say okay. you don't got to do it. But yeah. Yeah. Um, so that reminds me of something I heard in the Queer Eye episode that you're in, when they someone did a Greek reading 
a, a passage in the Bible. Oh yeah. Anyhow. Yeah. So there was a group. Well, that's it's part. It's connected to that story because there was a group of what ends up being 18 people who follow this 1500s rule that say when bishops try to require you to be celibate, defy them, and or, and congregations can ordain you anyway. Okay. So I was ordained breaking contemporary rules, saying that you were supposed to be celibate or not, or don't ask, don't ca- tell, basically, is what mm. it was. Um, but following ancient rules. So there were a period of years where, like, my name tag wouldn't say the word reverend on it, and I couldn't vote at meetings. So I was, And it was called uh, being ordained extraordinarily. So anyone who watched mm. the Queer Eye episode, I give Noah a red stole. I do remember that, That was yeah. passed from each of the people who were ordained extraordinarily to each other. Oh, God. Awesome. Yeah. I love that. I love that part of that show. And, yeah. And thank you for sharing that story. Yeah. Well, and so then in 2009, the Lutheran Church changed the policy. And they realized, what? God loves everyone, just like we've always been saying. I guess that applies to LGBTQ folk, too. And that's when you got your title. And, so or, then they had a service of... A rite of reconciliation, I think they called it, but it was to make us ordinary. Okay. I don't think it took, but they tried. Okay. But we got to be on the official list of pastors, and we could vote in the church, and they'd put the word reverend on the name tag. Mm-hmm. The ironic thing is, because I'm the very first person elected bishop who went through this extraordinary process, my job as bishop is to be in charge of, like, who becomes pastors, and I'm the person who keeps the list of pastors now. Okay. So, like, in charge of the process of, of helping to vet new pastors as they go through the process that wouldn't allow me to go through at the time, which I think gives me some insight into, like, Let's try not to be biased as we do this say, as we move forward. It's like you're the How can perfect we root that out? person for that role. Um, can we hear a little bit about? So you you went through seminary and then, but you know, after that, there was nothing preordained that you had to stay in the Bay Area. No, or well, come to San Francisco. Even. My first year of seminary, I started working with the homeless and hungry on Polk Street. Okay, and worked there all the way through my seminary training okay. and continued working there for 12 years. Okay, so it was a job. Yeah. Yeah, okay. eating with the homeless and hungry. Never a thought of going somewhere else and doing anything else. You were like... Well, that was the problem is I wasn't on the official list of, of pastors, mm-hmm. so um, I couldn't go through the like normal way of being hired to work in a church without mm-hmm. that church being put like on trial and Got getting it. kicked out. So I was called I was called and ordained here because four congregations in San Francisco decided they didn't care if they got kicked out. And it's awesome. it's four congregations that I think have never agreed on anything since. Right. The Purple Church on top of Portola, her yeah. church. Yeah. Yeah. Christ Church Lutheran that only uses Lord language for God. And where are they? They are in the sunset at Quintara and like 20th or 21st. Okay. And St. Francis Lutheran Mm -hmm. at Our Lady of Safeway is what most people know them as because they're at Church and Market. Yeah. And Santa Maria Santa Martha, a Spanish speaking congregation at at South Venice and 21st ish or 20th. Okay. They're, They're the location of the LGBTQ homeless shelter. Oh, okay. Uh, so those four congregations were like, yeah, let's do this. Can I just go out on a limb and say that like that speaks to San Francisco? Yeah. And the oh, culture that, that does that is still here. Mm-hmm. Um, welcoming, accepting. Yeah, so on their behalf, I kind of continued kind of working with the homeless throughout San Francisco and with purpose because to me it seemed that most of the folk who during that time period of the early 2000s that were living on Polk Street were folk who had been kicked out of the Midwest or other places because they were LGBTQ. And when the AIDS crisis happened, were not fun to party with anymore and were sort of like left to their own 
lives on the sidewalks. And so it was like caring for people who weren't lucky enough to have families who love them as much as mine did, or weren't lucky enough to have congregations that love them as much as mine did. And so it really felt like it was giving back not only to the the queer community, but also like the things that were hard about the Midwest. Like, and I and we did a, a history project with homeless youth in the Tenderloin around 2011-ish, where we actually went on a speaking tour with Mia Too Much and Joey Plaster, and I would play Lady Gaga mass. I wrote a Lady Gaga mass, like okay. you do. Mm -hmm. And so we would go to towns all over the United States where they had LGBTQ homeless shelters, talk to the youth about what their needs were, and then go to a congregation nearby to remind that congregation that the the way they speak publicly about LGBTQ people is resulting in homelessness here in San Direct Francisco. Direct causation. Yep. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. When was that? 2011-ish. Okay. About yeah. 10 years ago. And it's still true that here in San Francisco, statistically, 40% of both the youth and adult population are LGBTQ. Of homo. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. So homophobia around our country creates homelessness here in San Francisco because right. people think I will be safe at least I'll be safe there and then who can afford it right, right. let alone all the other things that might accompany people whether it's addiction issues or mental health issues or all the other things that are hard that go with homelessness there is a population of people who are homeless in San Francisco because they either were explicitly told or believed their communities couldn't love and accept them where they grew up. Right. It's one of those things where I'm like, well, I'm glad there's somewhere for folks to go. Can we talk? Can we get back to you real fast? Yeah, I guess. Can we talk about meeting your wife? Yeah. I met my wife doing therapy homework. Okay. I had a therapist. I'd had a bad breakup. And the therapist was, like, wanting me to, like, accept that, like, sometimes you have a bad breakup and you, like, didn't do anything, you couldn't have done anything different. And so the therapist was like, so for next week, I need you to go online, like, make a profile, oh, so and get a date. Okay. And so I had to have a Fun date therapist. before the next week. Okay. As a way to, like, just be like, we'll see how it feels, right? Right. Because, I don't know if you know this, but when you are a pastor, it's very hard to date. I didn't know that. I'll take your word for it. Well, because ethically, you can't date anyone you meet at church. Okay. Because that would be that makes, misconduct. That makes sense. And if, particularly if you're queer, if you go to a gay bar and say that you're a faithful person, that eliminates half of the dating pool. Or if you go to Christians and tell them you're LGBTQ, right. that's like, it's a whole own other thing. And so... Too gay for the church, too churchy for the gays. Yeah, so you got to pick someone you've never met at church. Right. And it's from a small percentage of people who are fine with your job and who you are, right? In and addition to all the other struggles of, like, dating in a city. Right. Did you date only women? Did you date women and trans identifying? Or... Um, women, uh, I found that as being someone who is transgender, that there was a lot of fears that you would never be able to, like, find a partner who would accept you, whatever happened. And I knew that, like, I was on a journey rather than already there. Mm -hmm. And I, my whole, <clears throat> my whole life kind of is about, like, well, let's see what happens next. Like, let's, let's go on this pilgrimage. Let's become a bishop. Yeah. Why not? Purple shirt. Wonder what that's like. Yeah. So, um, so, but I found that in San Francisco, uh, bisexuals are very open, or some of them are very open, about, like, we. I don't know where your journey is, but I'm, if, if they're open to being attracted to people where they're, wherever they end up on the continuum, that that's a lot more freedom in a dating situation. Okay. So, had homework assignment to go on a date. My wife was the person I picked for the date. Can I ask what, um, 
Was it an app, you said? or Okay Cupid. Okay. At the time, they had the most variety of, like, being able to self-identify. Right. When was this, also? I'm going to say that it was 2013-ish. Okay. 2012-ish, somewhere in there. Yeah. A lot of the ones now didn't exist, also. Right. Yet. Yeah. So. No, it was, like, back when you had to, like... Do like play weird OK Cupid games in order to like have it be free. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you had to use Match.com. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, went in a date in the financial district. I was gonna ask where. Yeah. She. Um, I don't know if the bar even. It was like a dinner place near her work. It was okay. Something about like hops and something like something about frogs and something. Okay. It doesn't. It was a hipster, mm. like dinner pub kind okay. of place. Okay, but like a financial district hipster. Sort of. It was more like, like near Battery ish. Okay. Right. And bad first date. Oh. She just wouldn't stop talking. She was like so nervous. Okay. That she didn't stop talking. She said a couple unkind things about her twin brother that okay. I was like, I don't know what this says about your character. Put off this, yeah. But at the end of the date, she liked me so much she fell off the sidewalk there while we were waiting for the light to change. And I was like, well, that was kind of cute, right? That's young love. And I think the therapist was just like, well, you're doing this for homework. Like, what? You don't need the, per- the person to be like, do this to see how it feels to date. So there you go. But she lived in Oakland, so... Oh, major strife. That was... I love Oakland. That was strife, yes. Yeah? Yeah. And you lived in the city? Yeah. Okay. I lived in the Tenderloin. Okay. Oh, in that... In the, the, in the condo. The, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, and then after we got married, we knew that we wanted to adopt and to have a diverse family, and in order to adopt from the foster care system, we knew we needed certain, like, room specifications, so we moved to the Sunset, which was near, so I moved in 2014, I started working at Grace Lutheran in the Sunset, um, and wanted to live in the same district, and, and that was where, like, at the time, it was a cheaper place to have enough room to be able to adapt, and so... Thank goodness we did when we did, because... Because of money, or...? Way more expensive yeah, yeah. now. Like, okay. yeah. So you have two kids now. Two kids. Seven and eight. Awesome. Third and fourth grade. Awesome. They're about to get smelly and need deodorant. That's, like, right where we are in the... That's... In the spectrum. Right yeah, there. yeah, we're good. Okay. So let's hear about the becoming a bishop... Yeah. ...process, and then let's follow that with... Just your take on, like, like I said, our, our theme is we're still here. So, like, I would love to hear your thoughts, hopes for San Francisco now yeah. and this next, yeah, maybe coming out of a pandemic. I don't know. Well, but yeah. knock on all the wood that's nearby. Yeah. So, so those two things, the bishop process and then. So Lutherans elect bishops um, every six years. And you serve... Does Russia interfere? Sorry. Well, awful. COVID interfered. So yeah. we had an online assembly. Well, it got delayed an extra year. So they put... People, like, lift up names of people. They're like, you should put your name forward. And then most people take their name out because they're like, that's a tough job. And so 12 people kept their name in. But then COVID, like, the the election assembly got canceled. And so for like a whole year and a half, our name was like out there as like names that could be voted on. And it's um, electing how many bishops at a time? Just one. Just one. Just for our geographical area, which is like from near Visalia, all the way up to Oregon, and then all the way out to Elko in Nevada. So it's like 188 congregations. That's enormous. Yeah. I thought maybe it was just San Francisco. That's enormous. Okay. 
it's a giant amount of space. Now I really now, like, now there's a, like um, gravity. To yeah, it. I'm like okay. the pastor slash principal slash cheerleader for 188 congregations now. Um, but so the election process, like three people from each congregation get to vote. Okay. And so it's like. First, it's just like whatever name you want of someone who's a pastor, and then it's like of these people who said fine, you can leave my name in. Which one do you like? It's and then they coercive. narrow it down, narrow it down, narrow it down. How many were you up against? I don't remember the total number that were kind of in the thing, but it goes like after the third vote, it went to the top seven, who then oh, did a five-minute speech. It's a series of runoffs. Series of runoffs. Got it. Okay, okay. Yeah, then there was another vote, and then it went down to three. We had to answer like seven questions with five minutes each, and then it went down to two, and we had to do like a five-minute closing argument, is what they called it. But way before this, like, let's go back to Norway, because it's all apparently going to Norway during this story. Right. Uh, I was invited to speak at something called the St. Olaf Festival. Mm -hmm. You know him, the Viking who, like, murdered everyone if they didn't become Christian. Mm -hmm. um, very popular now. Because everyone's dead. Well, yeah, because <laughs> he had a cool beard. He had a cool hat. Okay. So... <laughs> Uh, they invited me to come speak at this festival on, like, can the church ever, like, recover from all the harmful ways they've thought about the body. Hmm. And the presiding bishop of Norway and, and Sweden and Finland were present and had to, like, respond to this panel conversation I was a part of. And the National Norwegian Newspaper, like, puts it in the newspaper that like this had happened because everyone was paying attention and they wrote in the caption that I was a transgender bishop okay so they put in a misprint mm -hmm. and I was so mortified because I thought people were going to think I had like gone to this other country and lied about lied. myself and so I thought I was going to get in trouble and somewhere on the flight home it's like 16 hours or something mm -hmm. it occurred to me that through this like mistake all of Norway believed there was a transgender bishop and then I thought it was kind of cool but then I wondered like well why don't I think a transgender person could ever be a bishop because we haven't had any since the 300s when the council of Nicaea said trans people shouldn't be allowed to be pastors anymore and so I decided to like go on this journey of like self-love to believe that I could be a bishop. Not because I thought I was going to win the election, but because I thought I'm a person who is doing all this public rooting for trans people. Like I love my trans kid, I love myself. Like if I can't believe that a trans person could be a bishop, how could anyone? And so I went on pilgrimage to Switzerland and visited the hermitage of my 16th great grandfather, the patron saint. Nicholas von Flew. Wow. Okay. Like you do, and like I went, I went to Germany and I went to all the places where Martin Luther was and learned about how like, like he was in so much danger from speaking his mind that his friends had to like kidnap him and take him to a to Wartburg Castle and he just used all of that angst and fear to like translate the Bible into poetry. Like he had, he just found this way to like keep going. Mm. And somewhere at the end of like visiting the places that I visited, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna leave my name in for this election. And I'm gonna, I'm, I didn't, I didn't believe that I was gonna win. Although when the Queer Eye thing came out during that year of waiting, I was like, oh, hmm. I wonder if this changes anything. Well. But but I just I just I wanted to act in a way that other people would believe there could be a transgender bishop. Like I didn't think Even it would if you be didn't me, win. but I wanted people to believe it was possible. Even if you didn't win, you mean. Yeah, and then I did. <laughs> that whole time all those runoffs where you like this is happening. Or this could like you, you There know. was a moment. I when the queer I think came out I was like, "Oh, 
oh, I might have to do that job. <laughs> and then it, like, right, it, it was a whole nother year until we had our election. And then that di- the day when the assembly started, I was just like, what was I thinking all this time, thinking that I could be a bishop? That's nonsense. Which is, I'm glad that I felt that way because then I, like, answered all the questions, like, with nothing to lose right. and not feeling like I would be disappointed. I wasn't nervous because I didn't expect anything. Right. It was a little shocking when I won, but yeah. I, just in case I got elected, brought with me a pair of very fancy shoes <laughs> that I had ordered for the funeral of my, my wife's aunt, who is the kind of person that when she went on vacation, Macy's would put up a sign saying, welcome home, because we missed you. <laughs> she just loved fashion. Okay. And, and that was a joke she told about herself, by the way. And so I had these amazing boots that were just like beautiful black gold flowers on them because I had this image of like if you get elected what will you do like what will be different how will your life be different and I was like I'm gonna change my shoes I think it's Mr. Rogers like because he always changed his shoes Yeah, yeah, yeah but I was so grateful I did because it gave me a moment like, because there were these long lace-up boots and my fingers, like, weren't working because I was in shock. And I was, and people were just like, you're the bishop, so are you going to, like, do all these things now? And I'm like, I got to change my shoes. Like, I can't answer any... I didn't plan past this moment because I didn't think it was going to happen. But you had those shoes. I had the shoes. And honestly, I can say that, like, you know, you get the, the uniform and you get the shoes, and that's... 98% of it. Like, 98%. show up with the embroidery and um, be present with people and be your authentic self and people are into it. I went I to that. I went to um, Grass Valley not too long ago and this... I think she was in her 80s. And I was talking to everyone and I got the whole thing on. I got the big, the big silver cross, I got the purple shirt... And because there was still kind of a part of me that was like, am I just like pretending I'm the bishop? Or am I actually the bishop? Like, what's Imposter happening? Imposter syndrome, right? Yeah. yeah. Am, I adu- am I an adult? I don't know. Oh. But in that day. room, they were like, you are our bishop. They were like into it. This, this probably in her 80s woman goes, I've never seen a trans person before. Okay. And then she does the long pause of like, where is this going? And she goes, it's just as I thought. You have two hands and two feet, just like everybody else. And I'm so glad I met you. Awesome. And then they let me like nerdily tell them about trans people in the Bible for like an hour yes. after that. And we're just like so twinkly eyed happy about it. that they were just like, please come back and tell us more stories about it. And I was like, OK, I guess I'm your bishop and Grass this Valley, is our world now if I may Grass Valley is one of those like corners of the world yes and so that's great yes that, that of happened. course Grass Valley there um, okay and uh, also congratulations by the thank way thank you I to express that um, I did it you, yeah <laughs> it's still a little weird but yeah um, well you look amazing Thank you. It's the purple. If it's right? the yeah, purple is always good color. Um, so San Francisco, like, what the heck? Where? What do we do? Where are we going? Hopeful. I mean, I, I feel yeah. like you're one of those folks who's actually doing the work. Yeah. Constantly, and, and since you've yeah. been here, you've been doing the yeah. work to make it better for a lot of people. Yeah. But it's a very different San Francisco than it was 20 years ago. In some ways, in some ways it kind of, I feel like San Francisco kind of gets better in some areas and then has struggles in other areas and then kind of is, you know, like like the trajectory of like every five years, Bernal Heights gets cool again. And I just think, I think we're in a place where addiction is really hard right now again. And we've had lots of cycles of that in San Francisco's history. I think I heard, well, but I had heard that we're on track to maybe have as many overdose deaths as the first year of the AIDS crisis. That, and that's with Narcan existing, where people are literally resurrected countless times every day in our city with overdose. And so I think addiction is at a tough level. I think 
mental health stuff is at a tough level, both for those indoors and living outdoors. Mm -hmm. I think um, we're trying to figure out how to be nice people in some in some ways uh, because language is changing and you know there are here's the way I'll put I'll talk about myself yeah. when I talk about like ways we all have to learn to be nicer is like when I'm walking I think I have the right of way when I'm on a bike I think I have the right of way mm -hmm. and when I'm driving I think I have the right of way mm -hmm. and I think that's a San Francisco way of being in the world. Mm -hmm. And when someone honks at me at a red light, I'm pissed. Mm -hmm. But darned if I don't do it every once in a while and I apologize in advance. But like, I try to do it less when I have the clergy collar on because I just feel like people don't need horns and shame. <laughs> but... They do need guilt though. I know. I think, <laughs> I think our... Um, our parks are really thriving. Like, I think we've got some really cool parks right now. I think some of our um, urban agriculture is at a really cool place in San Francisco. I think some of our, some of the, some of the street food areas are really popping and awesome. Um, I think there's some I think there's some tough stuff around schools mm -hmm. and having kids mm -hmm. and I think there is some discontent between those who work with tools and those who don't work with tools. Hmm. Um, meaning those who don't work with tools don't understand why people need cars mm -hmm. and those who do work with tools don't have a way to not have a car. Right. And we haven't figured out how to honor people who work with tools and the environment and the city we want to have in the future. So like, I hope that that's the next step of imagining like public transit. Mm -hmm. It's like, how do we care for people who work with really expensive tools so they don't get stolen? Or like, how can we care for that population? Mm -hmm. um, I think we're in one of those places where, kind of like in the 80s, where the city is pulling together. Like, there's a way in which we're all, like, in it together, sort of. I think COVID's a good example. Yeah, like, healthcare, like, similar to the AIDS crisis, the way the healthcare community was just like, we might die, but we're going to care for everybody, right? And I think um, there's some cool stuff, like, the ways that we reimagined, like, eating in parking spaces is kind of a cool imagining. I think the way I love public expressions of like what we need and so I think there's been a lot more creative street protests and advocacy. Slow streets. Slow streets but also like um, there's a bus in the Castro that plays dance party music that has cool ways for people to do speeches that are distanced and it drives all over and it and that connection was made because Burning Man was canceled right and so I just think there are some really cool ways that like street advocacy and street art is making a comeback there's some really awesome murals that are going up 100% yeah jails are having a hard time right now correct how we figure out tent encampments, another time period in San Francisco history that's having a hard time. How we figure out helping immigrants settle into our community when there's a war happening. Mm -hmm. If it hasn't started yet, that's it's gonna happen. on its way. I yeah, sure hope so. I think. I, I sure think. Hope so. um, People have pulled together to try to end hate against the Asian and Pacific Islander community, and I think, or at least I hope, that will happen with Afghan communities mm -hmm. that are here mm -hmm. and might become more visible. Mm -hmm. uh, but I hope that we don't go through another wave of Middle Eastern mm -hmm. hate speaking, speech. Speaking of 20 years ago. Tough thing. Yeah. yeah, like I just, I feel like so much of it. Like, we lived through a recall before, right? 
we've lived through so many different changes in San Francisco that I think I love that San Francisco is resilient. I love that San Francisco fights to not gentrify the best it can. But then, like, when a community diasporas to a different part of the Bay Area is like, peace out, like, we're still going to be cool. Like, we're still going to make this happen. Yeah. So, and I think um, the colleges and universities are doing really amazing stuff. So I just think it depends on like what you're focusing on. You could be utterly heartbroken that certain kind of like family-run businesses have closed or certain housing opportunities are harder or certain blocks feel unsafe to walk on or cars get broken into all the time. Like you could pick the list of things to focus on that suck. But if you think of it kind of in a in a longer time span, which I like to do as a nerdy historian, like, there's always things that are going really well, and always things that are like, well, guess it's going to be cheaper to live in that neighborhood for a while, right? And I don't really know what to make of it, but there's enough beauty and art and things in bloom kind of throughout town that if you work at it, or seek it out, you can always have something to feel hopeful about. That was Bishop Megan Rohr. On the next episode of Storied San Francisco, our last until November, we reconnect with past guest of the show, poet, doctor, and musician, Gava Johnson. Please join us for episode 25 next Tuesday, wherever you listen to podcasts. Music for the podcast was produced, performed, and curated by Otis McDonald. Original photography is by Michelle Kilfeather. Aaron Lim of Bitch Talk Podcast is our contributing producer. And the show is produced and hosted by me, Jeff Hunt. Now in our fourth season... We have more than 160 episodes available on our website, storiedsf.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you can, please rate and review our show so we can reach even more folks. We love email. Drop us a line at storiedsf at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Stay strong, stay healthy, keep dreaming, and we'll see you next time on Storied San Francisco. is a proud member of the BFF.FM podcast network. Learn more at podcasts.bff.fm. BFF.FM, best frequencies forever.